Today is the day to uh, wrap up Ephesians. Uh, in fact, one translation, if you take chapter 6, is where we are ending up with today, chapter 6, and it's actually part 7. Most of all of these messages have been recorded. They are on the Church Facebook page. So if you want to view any of the messages in the past to see how we got to where we are today, you can certainly listen to those. And, uh, and I apologize, some of them are lengthy. Give yourself, uh, you know, a little bit of a lunch break for an hour. <laughs> and some of them are a little lengthy, but yet they are, I think, important. One commentator says when he gets to um, chapter 6 and he gets to uh, verse 10, where we use the word in the NIV, finally, be strong in the Lord. And he says, let's wrap this thing up, the commentator said. Paul's wanting to wrap up the whole message of what Ephesians stands for. And he's trying to bring that to a conclusion that makes sense for these people that he's been dealing with. If you've been studying with us, the book of Ephesians deal with uh, basically three areas, spirit, soul, and body. So in the very first chapters of Ephesians, he is dealing with the subject of uh, this inner man and your spirit. And then he deals with the soulish part of us. And last week we actually talked about some of the soulish part, which is dealing with our will and our emotions. And when you talk about we talk about husbands and wives, and he gets into chapter 6, he actually starts talking about family. That's all about dealing with your will and your emotions and your relationships you have with one another. And hopefully if you have the right spirit within you, in the first couple of chapters of Ephesians, if you have the Holy Spirit working in you and through you, in other words, you've had a change in the innermost parts of you. The Holy Spirit has come alive in you. He's speaking to you. He's talking to you. He's whispering to you. He's, he's ministering to you in a bright way. He's bringing you revelation of who God is. That's what the Holy Spirit does inside of us. And so as he's doing that and the, the spirit man is being changed, Paul's obvious next step is that your inner man being changed, guess what? Your soulish man better change. It requires that, your will. Your, that's the whole word that nobody likes, the S word in Ephesians chapter 5. Submission has to do with your will. It's not just for women to say, I like it when years ago we took the word obey. Wives, you'll obey your husbands. When you do the marriage vows, Will you obey your husband? Well, we took that out. And now it's just a matter of that. Will you love one another, etc.? Because the if it's assumed that you already are going to do what you have to do to get along and make adjustments in your relationships if you're going to last at all. There's a whole sermon in that whole thing. And my wife said I didn't emphasize enough about the men's part of this thing. Women are willing to submit. So when I got home, I got a, a, a three-point sermon <laughs> on how I'm supposed to die. <laughs> because, you know, after all, the husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So, sweetheart, <laughs> have you died lately? <laughs> and all that you can testify the fact how humble I am and I'm totally submissive to, to Charceline over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I died. She didn't die. The woman's alive, the man, anyway. That's a whole other sermon. We'll deal with it later. I've only lived, lived with her 58 years, so it's, I think we've got it worked out a little bit, and, and I know my place. I know who, I may be the head of the family, but I know the neck that turns the head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh no. Where did I go? Okay. <laughs> so we're dealing with spirit men. Paul's dealing with Ephesians. This is why it's so powerful, the whole series, as you go through it. You see how God is dealing with spirit man in the church that... Uh, in Ephesus, the Ephesians, 
Then he deals with the will of men, or the, what we call the soulish man, which is your emotions and your will. And you see all that as he's saying. So what happens to me in my spirit in time may not happen instantly, but if the Holy Spirit is really inside of you and alive, your will, your emotions will change. And it doesn't take a husband or wife to dictate that to you. The Holy Spirit convicts you to do it. He prods you. Lots of different words that we could use, but the Holy Spirit is actively doing. So it's not Charcy, it's not uh, me, it's not the husband-wife relationship or the kids. If those kids would just behave, we want to pray that the Holy Spirit comes alive in our kids so that then they will submit and not rebel against what the Holy Spirit's doing. And relationships with families, as you go through this whole experience, you find out how it balances that it's the Holy Spirit working through us and in us that makes the change. Then Paul gets to this final chapter. He's wrapping it up. And to draw a picture for what it's supposed to look like. And that's what he gets to, verse 10. And he starts saying, you've got to put on the armor of God. One of the key phrases that keeps coming up in the book of Ephesians from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 6 it's the subject of taking off and putting on. Taking off and putting on. Taking off and putting on. What he's relating to is that you don't wear the same old clothes you wore last year every day. Spiritual clothes. Your spiritual robe is constantly changing in the spirit and it's so important that we as believers understand that, that if you are still wearing the same old spiritual garments that you used to wear shame on you i'm going to use a real hard term doesn't sound very christmasy but you would stink that's true the preaching right there <laughs> So, so we need to change. There needs to be this changing. There needs to be this taking place of constant change in your life. That you're no longer the same as you once were, is what I'm trying to say. Now you are a new creation. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit is developing Christ in you. So our whole identity, remember the book of Ephesians about is our identity in Christ. And the whole process that we've been going through from spirit to how we dress in the spirit, our spiritual garments, is all based on this process that he has us going through in our life. Remember we talked about being, being I am saved, I'm being saved, I will be saved. There's a process that's taking place in me that the Holy Spirit is at work in me. Now, I believe he draws this beautiful picture of the armor of God for us to understand how we're supposed to look like in our identity of Christ. If we put on all the pieces of the armor, just consider yourself looking like Jesus should look like. Not necessarily as a soldier, but in the spiritual garments of the spiritual armor, all represent who Christ himself in his fullness is in us. In our lives. So when you put on these things, there's just uh, th there's a few things at first that are somewhat defensive. Defensive then means that they guard you from things coming towards you. We're going to talk about that just when I'm going to read the scripture. You'll see this as it comes out in just a moment. Then there's offensive things. There's like the sword of the spirit or the word of God, which is an offensive tool. For you to do battle. <coughs> so he is preparing us. Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus. All these experiences that you're going to be going through. God has not left you without that which you need to defend yourself. And also offend the message that God has asked us to spread throughout the world. So let's go to verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6. I'm reading from the NIV. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God 
so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, quite a bit of discussion was done the other night in our Bible studies in regards to this subject of heavenly realms and what's taking place. There is a spiritual realm, there's a natural realm, and then there's a spiritual realm, or what we call the heavenly realm. And there's an area where battle is being done right now. I believe there are battles taking place in a spiritual level. You and I, as believers, need to understand that God is preparing us and, and so that we will acknowledge, like this scripture says here, for our struggle, in verse 12, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, he says, because of this condition, it's a spiritual battle that's taking place. And some battles you and I weren't actually meant to be involved in. It's for God's angels and for his spiritual realm to do the battling for us against the demonic world. Okay? So when we get down here to this whole concept then, this is where I think, if you go back to a couple other chapters, Paul tells them in chapter 5 it is, he tells them to wake up and realize and rise up because your light has come. And when I say to the church today, and to each one of us, we need to wake up that there is a spiritual battle taking place. And it's over us. The devil wants you. Jesus wants you. And that battle is going and pulling. You wonder why you have temptation? That's the enemy trying to take you down. You wonder why you have... Me besetting sins and habits that you get in locked into, addictions, etc. That's the devil. It's a spiritual realm that's trying to suck life out of you. And you need to wake up, church. The church of Jesus Christ and the day in which we live, especially coming to 2023, we are going to be tested more and more and more. And it's a spiritual battle that's taking place in all kinds of levels of the heavenlies, if you please, in the spiritual realm, that God is at work fighting on your behalf to make sure that you have a stable life and your blessings of God are on your side. He wants you to be delivered. He wants you to be powerful. He wants you to be an overcomer. He wants you to have victory after victory after victory. And so as you and I go through this experience, we realize there's the spiritual realm, and it's a spiritual battle, and somebody wants me. I know that from personal experience. I'm not going to get into personal illustrations, but just family members and people that you know, or my own life, when things come up, all of a sudden you wonder, where'd that come from? Where'd that thought come from? Why, why did that person do that? What, what's, and you, these unexplainable moments, oftentimes are areas where the enemy is testing you to try to find out where your armor is not covering you. He's trying to penetrate where there's an empty spot and your armor has cracks in it. He's looking for it. So I mentioned to the folks Wednesday night, you'll notice when you put on the armor of God, there's nothing to protect the back. <coughs> Because God never meant for you to run away from it. Yeah. He meant for you to go forward yep. into the battle. That's his desire. I'm going to get to my sermon pretty soon. Being <laughs> tired, all right? It says lights, all tight. Therefore, put on, verse 13, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. After you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, 
and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. I'm going to pause there just for a moment. So if you're writing down some notes, God wants you to be prepared. And how do we do that? It's a spiritual experience, but we are putting on, preparation is putting on our armor. You just don't go to battle because, well, I heard there's a battle, so I'm going to go out and do something. You better make sure you have your defensive armor on. Put it on and be wise and be prepared. That's a good boy scout, you know. Be prepared. Amen. That's the boy scout. Boy scout model. And so it is with us in the spirit. So I would ask you to ask somebody next to you right now, are you prepared? Are you prepared? God, ask them. Are you prepared? <laughs> and the preparation comes from the fact that you're aware of the fact that this is all taking place, that there is a spiritual battle for your soul. Starts with your mind. Remember, well, we talked about that, the Holy Spirit's alive. Anyway, all those kinds of things are so important, for, but you need to be prepared, and part of being prepared as being aware and having things ready. I kind of I illustrated this Wednesday night, and I'm sorry, I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but I picture for some reason, uh, I like Chicago Fire as a TV show, and I like watching the, the firemen as they come out and to get into their, uh, of course, uh, their vehicles and, and fire engines, etc. But they always have their stuff out there and it's ready for them to jump in, pull up and put their straps on, their helmet on, etc. They're not going to go to fight a fire without all their coverings on them to protect themselves. They're prepared as soon as the alarm sounds to go and put on what they need to defend themselves from the flames that they believe they're going to be involved in. Believers, we need to be the exact same way. Be prepared enough to know that your Bible is close by, your prayer partners are close by, the prayer chain is close by, people that you might have confidence in in their prayer life, you're able to call them, you have phone numbers, you have a positive response, you're prepared. What's your 911 number for spiritual concerns? I'm serious. What's your 911 number for an emergency in the spirit? What's Jesus' number? That's the thing. What do you do? What's your instant response? My mom taught me this, and I taught again and again. It's amazing how I use my parents so much to, as an illustration, but I've been blessed by some good parents. My mom didn't believe in medicine. And so when I was raised in a home, and even though years later she had to have medicine for a lot of things because of all her physical needs. But when we were younger in high school, we'd get a headache. We weren't allowed to take aspirin. We were told to pray. Mom's quick response to everything, we broke something, whatever, was always, before you go to the doctor, before you take any medicine, we are praying. Now, you might say that's extreme and that's, you know, I don't want anybody to, to do something that their doctor wouldn't want you to do. But at the same time, I think sometimes we, well, I know some people, if you have a financial need, it used to be, and it's an old loan company called Beneficial. Remember, remember Beneficial Finance? And I remember using the illustration once. When you have a, a financial need, most of us dial Beneficial Finance right away because they gave cheap, quick loans. Rather than praying and asking God to supply the need. If you have a financial need, what's your plan to resolve it in the spirit? 
to all these things, we get so used to this, our society has dictated to us all over and over again who, what government agency is going to take care of you. Forget the government, folks. Rely on God. Now, he might use the government. He might use mean finances from some other sources to support and help you. But when we start responding too quickly to some of these other areas without relying on God first, we're privately telling the Lord, we really don't trust you, but I trust those politicians more. Oh. I may know I'm wrong with that, right? We wouldn't do that. So be prepared. Be positioned. Stand firm. Very important. If you are uh, going to be in battle, standing, learning how to posture yourself properly with proper balance. How well, has anybody heard that a, a wrestler in uh, school? Well, Should have known Constantine. <laughs> uh, anyway, I won't have you two wrestling. Jane, Jane as well. But one of the first things they will teach you is your stance. Your position, the balance of your feet. Because for you to be able to have defensive positions, you must have good balance and sturdiness on your feet. You have to. Otherwise, somebody come along, and if you're not standing correctly, they just push you over nearly with their finger. It's amazing. Uh, so you learn this process of learning how your where your stand is. And you as believers. We need to learn how to stand and position ourselves properly, our balance in the things of God. So what do I mean by that? How do I stand? By a study of God's Word. This helps bring balance to my life. This is the bread of life. This is the substance for my soul that I need. I need to be positioned and stand with balance. There needs to be protection. That's why it talks about the shields, talks about the sword, talks about the belt of truth, all these things that we're talking about, which are vitally important for us. So we put on the armor of God, make sure we cover all the parts so the enemy can't get his flaming arrows in on you. Amen? Amen. That's important. Put on the armor of God. Some for defense, some for offense, but it all represents when it's placed on you, it's Christ. You are robed completely in who he is and his faithfulness to us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now can I get to my sermon? <laughs> I think one of the most important things that we have to do is be praying, and that's where in this message today, I think one of the main things I, I want to be able to cover for you today is the subject of um, not only the areas of understanding who we are in Christ by the armor of God, but that it's a spiritual battle, and we've been talking about that already. But thirdly, the prayer life of believers. To find balance in your life, you need the Word of God, but you also need prayer. If statistics are correct, I read through Barner, who is a uh, statistical guru for church ministries, etc. And he says that most ministers don't spend more than five minutes a week on their sermons in prayer. Now that just blew me away when I first read that. How in the world can you only spend five minutes a day in prayer? Or, or for, on a specific sermon and averaging that type of thing. They don't have enough time because of all the other administrative things that they're doing. And if ministers only have a short, brief time, how much time is the congregation spending in prayer? And there's all kinds of prayer. And Paul is saying this to the, to the church, didn't he? He says in verse 18, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers. I like that phrase in NIV, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying 
for all the saints. So he's talking about the types of prayer that we have. So we have intercessory prayers. Everybody know what intercessory prayer? That's when you're praying for someone else. On someone else's behalf. Right now I'm praying intercessory prayers. Charcy and I pray intercessory prayers for certain family members that we're concerned about or that have been laid on our heart or some of you that have been placed on our hearts. We're praying intercessory. We're pleading with God on your behalf. It's called intercessory prayer. There's petition prayer. Petition prayer is when you just have your grocery list. I don't mean to play it down, but it's just basically, you know, here, Lord, bless mom, dad, etc. or here's my petition, here's a certain need, and we start listing the, the types of needs that you might have in your life, and you list those things as petitions to the Lord, and that's important as well. Those are important prayers. We need to have petition prayers. Something that will keep us on our knees. There's times in prayer that you need to just spend time praising. And Paul says, you know, with all kinds of prayers, praise is a type of prayer. Yeah. And I believe a lot of us need to praise God a whole lot more. Yeah. And feel free to uh, exercise our arms and our hands and our voices and shout to the Lord with a great shout and, and whatever the expression might be in your praise, clapping of hands and so on. There's all kinds of uh, illustrations in scripture in regards to these types of praise and prayer. So intercessory prayer, petitional prayer, praise prayer, praying for the sick, the laying on of hands, specifically praying for those that are ill. The Bible talks in the book of Hebrews, but called for the elders of the church that may lay hands on the sick, anoint with the oil, and the prayer of faith shall heal them. So in church, when we hear what Paul is saying, wrapping it all up in this thing, he is wanting us to emphasize, not only put on the armor of God, understand it's a spiritual battle, and the things that we've referred to, but now he's telling us, know how to pray all kinds of prayers. There's not one specific prayer is the answer. The way you pray is just as important as the way I pray. You're reaching into the realms of glory and touching heaven. We used to use the term getting a hold of the horns of the altar. Anybody ever heard that phrase besides me? You get a hold of the horns of the altar. That is meaning that you're doing spiritual battle on your knees at an altar. And you've got a hold of it, the horns of the altar, and you're not letting go until God answers. See, that, that's what Paul was trying to tell the church at Ephesus. This whole emphasis, what they're going to be dealing with. Church, what you and I are going to be dealing with in 2023. It's going to take this church. I know a lot of us believe that God's going to do a miracle in this church. And he is doing miracles yeah. in this church. He's going to continue to bless this church. Yeah. He's going to anoint this church. But I want you to know as your pastor... None of it's any good unless it's based on prayer. Amen. Yeah. And a breakthrough of what God wants to do amongst the body of believers. Yeah. And if you're doing just lay me down prayers, you know, dear Jesus, bless mom and daddy, you go to bed at night. We need people that are willing to get a hold of the horns of the altar and will pray until God breaks through. Yeah. And that we live in a level or in a realm that only he can bless. And it's so important. Paul even said it this way in verse 19, pray also for me. Whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chain. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So prayer is what we need. We need the weapons of our warfare is prayer. We can pull down strongholds through prayer. Yep. Yes, you can release the preacher through prayer. I don't know. I just love reading about Billy Sunday or Billy Graham. 
or some of these other great evangelists. Anybody heard of Billy Sunday besides me? Billy Sunday and Billy Graham both are two that come to my mind quickly in regards to the illustration of the need in prayer and their evangelism. Billy Graham didn't go hold a crusade just because he wanted to hold a crusade. Usually it's somewhere about three months to six weeks prior to going to a city they had around the clock, 24 hour day prayer taking place. You think it was any accident people came forward in Billy Graham services or Billy Sunday services? It was because people were praying and pulled down the strongholds which opened the doors so that when Billy made the call, people came in the name of Jesus. His sermons didn't have to be great, eloquent types of theological truth and preach for an hour like I do. It was just a matter of a simple message, gospel, that God honored and people came because others had already paid the price of praying. Yeah. Praying. Yeah. praying. That's what we need as a church so that we can proclaim the gospel as Paul desired to do, even in chains. Now let me just share this with you, and I'm going to close. This guy in the next scripture, verse 21, Tekhius, Tekchikas, uh, what do you want to pronounce it? Tech, well, I should ask Larry how to pronounce it. Tekhius. The dear brother and faithful servant, the Lord will tell you everything so that you may also may know how I am and what I am doing. And what I thought was interesting, <clears throat> my fourth point for today, we've already talked about putting on the armor of God, understanding the spiritual battle, the importance of prayer. But I think one of the most important things is understand that we don't do ministry alone. Amen. Paul did not do ministry alone. Jesus Christ himself chose not to do ministry alone. He had 12 disciples. In the book of Acts chapter 20, I won't go to there right now, but Paul's starting his third missionary journey. And there are what I call the Magnificent Seven, there were seven guys that were there to help support him and take his ministry because Paul knew when he met with the leaders of the church at Ephesus that he was going to go to Jerusalem or to Rome and be in prison. But he needed someone to carry on the gospel to all these other churches, individuals in the area. And this I don't know why I have a mental block on it. Tichikos. Yeah. I just go call him Ty. Yeah, I'm going to call him Ty. <laughs> this guy represents you and represents the leaders in our church. Pastor Wood isn't the only person in this church that does ministry. We have a lot of people just like and he was a dear brother and what's the quality that he had I think what's interesting when you study him and you look at his four different places in scripture that his name is mentioned and everyone each time it refers to him as a person who brought and Paul says this I'm bringing him because he's going to encourage you he was a person of encouragement what does that mean to me that, that when I read that word encouragement I mean he has a positive mindset. Paul's in prison writing these letters, but he's sending these guys out to make sure the message of the kingdom of God is being presented properly. And times of words of encouragement needed to come from this follower of Paul. He was faithful to do what he was asked to do. What an important ingredient in a personality in a life that he would take time to minister as Paul directed him and Paul gave him information to pass on to the churches and he was capable of doing that work. 
He shared the truth. He shared what was really happening. He didn't have to, he, he didn't have to make up a story. He just would share whatever Paul said was the truth and what Paul was experiencing, the imprisonment he was going through, the illness that they were going through. But this guy was able to make sure that the truth was being shared and represented factually to the rest. Somehow Paul alludes to him as a person that was proven and trusted to carry on with the message of the kingdom of God to the body of believers. So Paul's ministry was really dependent on people like Tetchikas, boy, sorry about that, who ended up spreading this gospel and making sure that others got the message so that they could pass it on to other people. In our church, there are leaders as well that have done the same thing to where they are faithful people, they're encouragers, they share the truth, they represent uh, what we're doing here in the body of believers. And a lot of them are proven and trusted with the message and been tested through life. And we're so grateful for them within this church body. That's exciting to me. So when Paul wraps up this whole message to the church at Ephesus, he leans it all on one guy and gives him the word to share with the churches. God has given you and I, you and the leadership of this church, you as members of this church, you that are those that come and fill these pews, he's given us all the responsibility to encourage one another, strengthen one another, share the truth with one another, be there for one another, represent factually what God is doing 